Good morning and welcome to Southridge. Whether you're joining us on Sunday morning from home or sometime during the week while on vacation, we're so thankful that you've carved out this time in your week. If you're new to the online service experience, just a few tips to help you make the most of our time together. First, turn up the volume. We found that to be especially helpful in our times of singing together. Secondly, if you scroll down to the resources section below this video, you'll find several links that will hopefully be helpful for you. These include transcripts of today's message for anyone with hearing or language challenges, as well as chord charts for any of you musicians who want to play along. You're joining us today on week two of our current series called One Prayer Niagara. This series has been so exciting for us as we're coming together with our spiritual siblings from two other Niagara churches, Bethany and Central. It's been such a privilege to join together in the kind of unity that Jesus calls us to. And we're loving how this online environment is making it easier to learn from each other, be encouraged by each other, and celebrate the unique ways that Jesus is reflected in each of our communities as we all seek to reach Niagara with God's love. In week one, we were both inspired and challenged to work towards that heart of unity. And we look forward to more of the same today. Check it out. Well, hey everybody, it's so good to be together with you all again. Three churches worshiping as one. And we really are one. We are one spiritual family with one heavenly father anchored in one faith. And we're gonna start our time together by singing of God's unending love and his amazing grace. Here we go.
built on your strong, firm foundation. God, when we are motivated by your love, there is more that unites us that could ever divide us, God. And we just pray that we would be inspired by your love to change Niagara, to change the world around us, and to see you glorified and your kingdom come. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 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 Welcome to another week of being brought together uh, here in our online service format. Uh, it's a real gift to be united in this way, especially in a time where we can't all physically to be together. And that's especially true in these weeks uh, where we're, we're not just together as a Southridge community, but also together with uh, Bethany Community Church and Central Community Church as we seek to practice and embody the oneness that Jesus gave his life for. Uh, but even cooler than that, uh, having just shared in the Apostles' Creed that we just heard, uh, we're actually practicing unity with all of our spiritual siblings around the globe and throughout history, as that has been the epicenter of our faith for nearly 2,000 years. Now, maybe you are new to all of this, and maybe by way of an invitation from a friend, or you just had heard something about Southridge, or maybe you were just Googling, looking uh, for an online church service. Maybe uh, you are participating and experiencing something like this for the very first time. And you might not be sure how you even feel about all this church stuff or, or what you believe about Jesus. But if that's you, uh, we just want to say welcome. Uh, we are so glad and humbled that you found us in this format. We hope that you can feel a, a part of the family, and we want you to know that, that we love you, and uh, we hope that this service provides encouragement and inspiration, and that maybe you'll consider participating again sometime. But for today, uh, just as a way to say thanks so much uh, for checking us out, we would love to give you a gift. And it's a jar of our artisan jam from our social enterprise, the Southridge Jam Company, which supports those experiencing homelessness in our region. Uh, so if you go to the, the new here section, just below the video player, and you click on the gift button, if you fill out some basic info there, uh, we would love to safely deliver to you uh, a, a gift jar of jam. Now in the spirit of giving, uh, I wanna remind and invite uh, all of us who make Southridge home uh, to contribute financially this week. I know it can be a bit weird to be doing uh, so much of this stuff uh, from a distance, but I know I have found that when we give financially, when we get some, some skin in the game in a tangible way, especially in this strange time, uh, it reminds us that we are part of something so much bigger than ourselves. And not only that, uh, but it, it fosters our commitment to God and to each other uh, to share God's love, to care for one another's needs, and to give of some of our excess to make sure that everyone has enough. So as, as always, uh, if you scroll down, you'll find some options here for online giving, and, and they're on our main giving page as well. Well, as we find ourselves kind of really now into the heart of summer, uh, one summer tradition and highlight around here is the uh, Global Leadership Summit. And that is a, a world-class uh, leadership conference that provides an annual injection of vision and equipping to help all of us grow in our leadership and our influence wherever we find ourselves. And uh, we've often described the Global Leadership Summit kind of like summer camp for adults, where, where we carve out two full days of our summer uh, to allow God to move and inspire us in how he wants us to make a, a positive and meaningful impact uh, with our lives. But obviously this summer, uh, plans and camps and conferences, they all look different. 
and the GLS is no exception. So this year's uh, GLS is gonna be a live broadcast made available exclusively online on August 6th, 6th and 7th. And uh, I don't know what your uh, disrupted or different or COVID-affected summer plans are looking like, but if you have any space in those days, maybe uniquely this summer, uh, we would love for you to participate uh, with us online and allow God to make that investment in your influence in, in your life as well. And what's cool that as an annual satellite host site of the GLS, uh, we have a special rate that we can offer our Southridge community. Uh, but what you need to know is that that rate actually expires this Tuesday, July 21st. So if you haven't registered yet, uh, go to our events page. You'll find the link to the Global Leadership Summit and you can sign up today. Now, as we uh, move into this week's talk, uh, I want to turn things over to Jeff Lockyer, and he's going to introduce our speaker for this week. Well, as we continue to discover the power of unity through this one prayer series together with Bethany and Central, I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, uh, Bethany's lead pastor, Andrew Mills. Andrew's been a pastor for 19 years, but he's actually been leading Bethany for only four because Andrew was the answer to the succession plan of the founding pastor of Bethany, a guy named Larry Schantz. And I say that because from my earliest ministry days, Larry was a good friend and mentor to me and to other leaders around Southridge and has always, on behalf of Bethany, been a good fan and friend of our church. And so when Andrew took over from Larry, Andrew continued that legacy legacy seamlessly by tracking with us as friends and fan and a fan of our church. Uh, Andrew's married to Krista and they have three young kids. In fact, I understand that their kids uh, attend school in the north end of St. Catharines along with some of Jeff Martin's kids. So there's all kinds of cool connections among our leaders. And uh, we're just really excited to hear what God has to say through Andrew now. So if you would open your heart and just prepare yourself to hear how Andrew wants to inspire us to God's vi vision for unity. Check it out. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you're joining with us here today. Welcome to my living room and a special good morning to everyone from Central and from Southridge. I'm really glad to be able to join with you here together. And today, before we kind of jump into things, I want to give you a quick intro into me and speaking and sharing and teaching that likely today, uh, at least two of three things are going to happen, whether I want them to or not. Uh, the first thing is, is that when I speak or share or teach, I often say amen. And this is going to happen because it just comes out of me. It's just kind of part of who I am. So as I'm sharing, I'll say something like maybe that Jesus wants us to change the world. And I'll say amen. And this is really a chance for you to actually respond either online with your family, friends, wherever you may be. And amen simply means I'm agreeing, I'm with you, or I'm uh, kind of following with you. So you can be... Uh, participating in that. Also, whether or not I want this to happen, my videographer is also likely to make some ridiculous comments. And for those people at Southridge and Central who don't know who that is, that's my wife, Krista. Say hi, Krista. Might as well get that hi. out of the way. Yeah. I'll be good. All right, she's gonna be good. And so the third thing that may or may not happen is that we have young kids. They may actually interrupt this thing. Uh, we never kind of know how that's gonna go. Like good parents, we have bribed them copiously with endless TV and snacks downstairs. But uh, I can't tell you how many Zoom calls have been interrupted in our family in our house and Bill and Jeff, even as we've been planning out this series that's happened. Uh, but today, I want to continue on in this series, really looking at this theme of unity and our prayers uh, for how we can work together and move forward together. And last week, Jeff shared so well on a vision of unity for us. Today, what I want to talk about is how does a vision of unity actually form us as people? How does it shape us? How does it change us? How does it actually move us? And to do that, I want to take a look today at a bit of an odd passage, actually. It's a passage that is often preached, but sometimes it isn't actually often reflected upon. And what we're going to learn today is that what a vision of unity does is it draws us together as people. That's something that it does for us. And that it also sends us as people. And so today, if you have your Bibles, I want to start in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, a passage that so many times has been preached very, very well. But today, I want to look at it from a bit of a different angle, not from the angle of going, but from the angle of what does this vision of unity do for us and through us, and especially for us as churches. And so if you have your Bibles, open them up there. 
And so here's the context of the book of Matthew. Here's what's going on at this moment in Matthew 28. What is happening is that Jesus has just died and resurrected. The entire world has been changed. History has been altered. Nothing is the same anymore. And what we're about to read is when Jesus shows up for the very first time to his disciples. When he reveals who he is, when he's there, when he speaks to them, when he commissions them and sends them. And I want to take a look at this here together. And so I want to read to you from Matthew 28, looking at how this idea of unity draws us together and sends us out together. So we read this. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey the commands I have given to you. And be sure of this, I am always with you, even to the end of the age. Now, when it comes to the book of Matthew, there are many different lenses that we could take to interpret it. You can take the lens of Moses and Exodus because Matthew is clearly portraying Jesus as the new Moses. You can also take the lens of integrity because this matters a lot for Matthew when he's writing about acting with integrity. You can also take the lens of change because Matthew is really actually writing to a community that's in immense upheaval and change. But today, when I look at this passage, today, the lens I want to interpret it through, the lens I want to come at it through is actually the lens of community is actually the lens of church. Because what we see here, really, whether you've thought about it or not, but this is almost the very first church expression, right? We have here people gathering together to worship Jesus, coming together right after his death and resurrection. And so I want to take a look at this passage through that lens of church and community, and especially unity, and what Jesus does when he shows up. And what we're going to see is that he draws us together, and then he sends us out. That's what unity does for us as a people. That's how it builds us and forms us. Let me show you from the text. The first thing that we read is this. It says this, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. I love that line. That they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. That one of the very first things that Jesus does, follow with me, that when he shows up is he draws together people, right, who are on actually different spaces and different sides of things. Because listen to what the text says. It says that when they saw him, right, this is the first time they were seeing him. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Let's put this passage in context and remember that this is history. This isn't just some story or fantasy. Let's remember the context of what's going on. The disciples have just seen Jesus brutally murdered by the empire above them, right? Peter and John say that they were witnesses to this in Acts. So they know that he's been killed. They know that he's been buried. They know that he has died. And this is the very first time that they are seeing him after his death and resurrection. They've heard reports that he is alive, but this is the first time that Matthew speaks of Jesus actually encountering them and revealing himself to them. And so Jesus shows up. They're seeing, you know, the uh, holes in his hands and his feet. They're encountering him for the first time. And what is the reaction of the disciples? What's their first kind of initial go-to? That some, full of faith, begin to worship and praise him. But then what else does it say? Is that some are like, yeah, no, I I don't know. I don't know, Jesus. I don't know. Right? Because the text tells us that they started to doubt. Right? That some worshipped and some doubted. They're literally doubting the Jesus that is directly in front of them. Right? That's what the text is teaching us. Right? Some of you, (laughs) some of you are wondering, has that line always been there in the Bible? And the answer to that is, like, yes, of course, it's always been there, right? So what does this mean for us, though? What does it mean for us? Well, I think if we take this passage seriously, I think if we let it kind of seep into our souls, our minds, and imaginations, what we'll notice is that when Jesus shows up, what he does is he draws together people who are different, in different spaces and places, right? Because here in the disciples, we see that some are worshiping and some are doubting, and that Jesus draws them both together. What this should mean for us as communities, as followers of Jesus, as churches, What this should mean for us is that when Jesus shows up, what he does is he draws people together across differences, right? And that church, really follow with me, church is for everyone, amen? It is for the people who are full of faith, who are on fire for Jesus, who are put together and just ready to worship him and to follow him. But it is also for not only the put together, but those who can't keep it together. The unsure, the doubting, the skeptics, the uncertain, the uneasy, and those who have burdens. It is for really every single person person. That's what this passage teaches us. That when Jesus shows up, because remember, this is like the first proto-church experience. That when Jesus shows up, what he does is he draws people together across differences. While there are some who are doubting, some who are worshiping, some who are skeptics, and some who are faith-filled, that's what's happening in the very first moment after Jesus' death and resurrection when he shows up to the disciples. So as Jeff shared with us last week, this vision of unity, what should it do within us? 
what I think it should do within us is the same thing that happens in this passage. We should be drawn together across differences. That's what Jesus does when he shows up. He draws us together across differences. But then not only that, not only that, he also sends us together. Let me show you from the text itself. And so then we go on to read that Jesus says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given to you. And be sure of this, I am always with you, even to the end of this age. Now, most often when this passage gets preached, what often gets emphasized is the going, right? To go out into all nations, to move, to go forward, to actually, you know, take a step forward into some way, shape, or fashion. And that's true, right? If you want to follow Jesus, you can't just stay where you are. You actually need to take some steps. But if you read this passage in the Greek, actually, the main point is not the going. The main point in the grammar is actually the making the disciples, the changing of worlds, the changing of lives. That's the main point. That's the main emphasis. That Jesus, for sure, is saying you have to go to make this happen. But the main point isn't just the going. The main point is the changing lives, the changing of people's hearts, the actual making of disciples. But then here's where we come to what I would like to say is one of the biggest modern day Western heresies that we have, okay? And that's that how when we interpret this passage or we interpret almost any passage, we do it through the lens of individualism. So when we hear this passage, we think about who am I going to go to? How am I gonna join in with Jesus in serving the world? But we think about what we are doing, not who we are sent with. And that's a problem because for the Bible, follow with me, the Bible never begins with the individual perspective. The individual experience matters, but the Bible prioritizes us together. It's always about us serving and moving out with Jesus together. It's a communal, relational, actual faith. So when we read this passage, our first thought shouldn't just be, how am I going to do this? It actually should be, who am I doing this with, right? Because when Jesus sends out the disciples, when he asks them to go out, when he authorizes them, when he actually says they will be you know, his representatives, this is all communal, relational language. In fact, if you read it in the Greek, what you'll notice is that everything is put in the second person plural. And I know, like there aren't many grammar geeks out there. I know that, that I'm kind of like in a small minority. Chris is giving me a, a, a smile, that for sure. There aren't many people who love this. Nerd alert. Yeah, nerd alert, nerd alert. This is what this means, okay? What it means is Jesus is talking to them. So when we read this passage, when we say, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, and Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. If I were to read these next passages in the South, this is what it would look like, actually. Jesus would be saying this, teach these new disciples to obey the commands I've given y'all. It's not just you individually, it's us together. And be sure of this, I am with y'all always, even to the end of the age. Because Jesus' perspective isn't just about what he wants to do with you or me, it's about what he wants to do with us together. It's always about us together. And while, while it's absolutely possible for you to practice Western spirituality on your own, follow with me, you cannot follow Jesus on your own. It's just not possible. We actually follow him together. We actually follow him as a community. And what does unity do to us as a people? What does it build into us? What does it form us to do? What it does is draw us together and to send us out together. That's what unity does. That's what Jesus does. That's what the church is all about, being drawn together and then sent out together with Jesus to join him in changing lives and to having our lives changed. So what does this mean for us all today? What is kind of my main point here with us this morning? My main point is just this, that when Jesus shows up, That when he shows up, what he does is he draws us together and he sends us out together. That's what unity does. That's what unity looks like. That's what unity forms in us as a people, as a community, as churches. He comes to draw us together and to send us out together. And remember, when I'm saying that he is drawing us together, it is specifically he's drawing us actually across differences. Remember that Jesus, when he showed up, there were some who were full of faith and some who were doubting, some who were skeptical and some who had trust. That Jesus is really about drawing us together across differences. That whether you are somebody who is so put together or can't keep it together, whether you are somebody who makes it to church on time all the time, who has never made it to church on time in their entire life, a la my wife, Kristen Mills. Okay, it's true. It's true, right? (laughs) That we are all welcome. That's the point. And that when Jesus shows up, he pulls us together across differences so that we might follow him together, right? So that's the first thing. And then when I said, though, that we are sent out together, remember, I am not just talking about having joint ministries and programs. It is so much deeper and better than that. I'm talking about how when Jesus Christ shows up, that he actually invites us to join with him and all the Christians in the ongoing work of God to actually bring heaven to earth as we pray about in the Lord's Prayer. This is about so much bigger than just you or me. It's bigger than that. It's about you and me and all of us together. 
So here's what I 100% believe, okay? I believe that if we're actually gonna change the world around us, we need to do this together. My one prayer for all of our churches and for all the churches in Niagara is that we would actually follow Jesus together. Because I believe that when Christians join together, when they get drawn together and then sent together, that's when lives are changed. Because follow with me, if we're actually gonna see even just Niagara changed, it's gonna take each and every one of us. And when I say each and every one of us, I mean more than just even Southridge, Bethany, and Central. I mean every single church that is a part of this region and this community. I'm talking about the 12 dozen plus churches on Scott Street. I'm talking about every single one of us joining together. Because what it requires is more than one church, one denomination, and one expression. If our world is going to get changed, it requires all of us to be drawn together and then sent out together with Jesus to join him in making this world a better place. To join him in making our region a better place. To join him in making our region look a little more Jesus-y. I know that might not be a word that you use, but it's one that we do. right? Because that's the business of the church and that's the business of Jesus, to transform our lives. So what does this mean for us practically? Well, I think practically what we can say is this, that when it comes down to this, that we need to actually put this into our lives, that we need to not only hear this, but to live it out. As I often say in our church community, that we gather not for information, but for transformation. Because honestly, if you want information, Google is way better than any of us, right? But today we actually gather to learn more, but then to be changed and transformed and sent. So how does this practically apply to us? Well, today I want to give you two kind of questions to drive this home for us. And they are just this, who are you welcoming and who are you joining with? Okay, who are you welcoming and who are you joining with? So first, who are you welcoming? When you look at this passage, what Jesus does when he shows up is he draws people across difference, right? You have people who are worshiping and people who are doubting. So I want to ask that question to you personally. Who are you welcoming? How are you creating spaces where people can have disagreements? How are you creating spaces and conversations where you can have differences of opinions and really joining with people in unity, even if you aren't believing all the exact same things? How are you holding spaces and conversations? How are you making sure to work across difference and invite people in who might be different than you? I think this is what we need to do. And notice with me, notice with me, I'm not asking what are your churches doing? Because I know what your churches are doing. They are all trying to create places where people are welcomed in, right? What I'm asking is how are you participating in this? How are you personally doing this in your conversations, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your communities? How are you making sure that we are welcoming in people who might be different than us? And here, Here's maybe where I lose some of you. Because I think many of you are like, yes, we need to be doing this. But here's where maybe I lose some of you. Because one of the problems with the church in the modern day Western North America is that there are so many people who love their theology more than Jesus. And this is a problem. Because we need to put Jesus first, which means we need to practice and live as he did. Actually welcoming people across differences, holding tension in conversation, and not just saying my way is the only way. There are so many people who put their theological predispositions above the person in front of them. And it's wrong and it's idolatry and we need to do better. We need to be welcoming people across differences. That's what unity looks like. That's what Jesus does. And I just believe that Jesus is in the same business that he was 2,000 years ago. That when he showed up to the disciples, he welcomed in people who were worshiping and skeptics and people full of faith and people unsure and he brought them together that's our calling too so first of all who are you welcoming who are you actually welcoming across differences and then secondly who are you joining with like who are you actually serving with who are you actually participating in the ongoing mission and work of God right because this isn't anything we can do on our own we actually need to join with others so who who are you joining with and again Notice with me, I'm not asking you what your churches are doing. I know that all of our churches are doing amazing work and amazing ministries that are changing lives. In Southridge, your anchor causes have a huge impact and are changing lives. In Central, your community crew is changing lives. And in Bethany, like, we got stuff going on too, okay? There are good things happening in each and every one of our churches. My question is, is how are you participating in that? How are you actually being the church, right? Who are you serving with? Who are you joining with? Who are you sent with? I think this is what we need to do. So today... I have one challenge for us to take this from, you know, discussion and theory and theology and abstracts and move it into formation and practice. My challenge for us is just this. Who can you welcome this week and how can you join with others in serving our community this week? Because as I said, my one prayer for all of us is that we might follow Jesus together, that we might be drawn together as churches, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, and then sent out together. So how can you participate in that? Who can you welcome and who can you join with? Practically, 
what this might look like is maybe for welcoming. Maybe that means inviting somebody over. You know, of course, following all safe social distancing and making sure that people's health is taken, you know, at the utmost. But maybe that means inviting in people who are different than you to listen and to learn. Maybe that means in conversations, holding up actual spaces for disagreement and doubt even, and welcoming that. And actually saying that if the first church had people who disagreed and had doubts, that it's okay for this church to have people who disagree and have doubts. Maybe it means just praying for God and for Jesus to expand your view of his kingdom. Because guess what? This is what I believe 100%, that there is no competition in the kingdom of God. Amen? There is no competition in the kingdom of God. And I don't care if somebody goes to Bethany, to Southridge, to Central, or to any other church. I want people to come to know Jesus, and that means welcoming people in. And I hope you're a part of that as well. And then secondly, what about joining? Well, maybe, maybe what this means is that if you're a part of a home church, a small group, or a life group, a part of your church, maybe it means just asking them, how are we going to actually not just hear about Jesus together and learn about him, but serve our community together? Maybe it'll mean, actually, if you know of a mission or a ministry that is having a huge impact, maybe it'll mean joining with them, but it better not be in an isolated, individual, short-term way. It better be a long-term endeavor. Maybe it'll mean gathering some neighbors together and just asking the question of how can we serve our community, or better yet, asking her joining the local neighborhood association and finding that out, and actually participating in what God is doing in our world. To be honest with you today, I don't know the specifics of how you might welcome and join with people, but what I know is that this is what unity looks like, what I know is that Jesus is about, and that this is what we should be about. So my challenge this week is just really simple. Might you welcome people in, and might you join with them in serving the world around us? And through that, through that, might we actually see the world changed? Because as I said, my one prayer is that we would follow Jesus together. I believe that's what unity looks like. I believe that's how lives are changed. And I believe that's how our Niagara community can be changed. When we actually follow him together. So with that, would you join with me in prayer today? Dear God, I just pray. Might we continue to follow you passionately and obediently? I pray, Lord, might we welcome others. Might we create space for others in our lives, in our conversations, and in our communities. I pray, Lord, we continue to join with you in the ongoing work that you are already doing in our community, that you are active. Might we have eyes to see you, and might we have a courage to join with you with others. I pray, Lord, might we continue to move away from individualism and move into community and move into unity, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us in that. And I pray that this week, this week, might we follow you, might we welcome others, and might we join with others in sharing the good news of your life, mercy, and grace. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. Grace and peace, everyone. Bye-bye. Who are you welcoming and who are you joining with? Those are really great questions to sit with this morning. How tightly am I clinging to an isolated and individualized spirituality? And how can I begin to undo that in my life? Those might feel like tricky questions to practically answer in this still socially distanced zone we're in. But of course, our lives ultimately only spring from the overflow of our hearts. And so sometimes, that's where we need to begin. Have you ever asked God to examine your heart and to help you know what's in there when it comes to unity? Last week, Tom mentioned the daily spiritual practice guide we created to partner with this series. It's a list of daily reflections based on the many references in scripture to how we are called to care for one another in the body of Christ, despite whatever distances exist between us. This week, as you spend a few minutes each day with those reflections, I encourage you and challenge you to start attaching some very real names and faces to those verses as you read. Encourage one another, bear one another's burdens, forgive one another, be devoted to one another. Let's let those instructions become very real pathways to a deeper walk with Jesus as we consider real people with whom unity does not come easy for us. Let's let these words from God begin to sink deep into our hearts and may it actually change us as well as our relationships with those around us. I hope you've had a chance to download that resource and if not, it's available again this week under the putting it into practice button on our weekly online service page. Also on that page, you'll find our virtual prayer wall. It's a great place to not only leave a prayer request, but to take time to pray for others in our community. If you're in a place of needing some practical support in the season, or if you're able to provide some support for others, you can connect with us via the need help or give help buttons on our website. Thanks for being with us today. We're looking forward to next Sunday when we conclude this series by hearing from Central's Bill Marco. Before we wrap things up and head into the rest of our week, I invite you to join us as we lift our voices together in this one final song. Let's make this our closing prayer today a prayer for unity, and the desire to see the church become a true reflection of God's kingdom on earth.
One with the Father, one with the Spirit, one with the Son of God. One with our sister, one with our brother, one family by the blood. Make us one, make us one. You will be done. Make us one. One heart. One heart with heaven, one mind connected, one body unified. Bind us together, now and forever, Jesus be glorified. Make us one, make us one. We confess all our offenses We confess we've been afraid We repent of all our pride Let all the hurt be washed away For all the wars and violence Against our enemy Come heal our land with your great river Restore our family And make us one Make us one you will be done Make us one Make us one Make us one Make us one And let your kingdom come